the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If you thought you were coming to the John Ortberg session, (laughs) thank you for those of you, and it's been many who have thanked me for my books, This is John Horper. This is Chris Ober. <laughs> Jesus can say anything he wants now. And he grabs for salt and light, the twin metaphors of salt and light, obvious, well known, basic. But he says more than that. He says, don't mess the opportunity up. Don't become saltless salt and invisible light. In original language, it's a double entendre, saltless salt. Saltless, tasteless salt. It will be useless in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us, don't mess this up. I'm intrigued. Both salt and light are necessary for companionship and hospitality. Salt. Salt, uh, salt is used to fertilize the crops that grow the food. It goes into the fire that roasts the food. It preserves the food. Salt, it seasons the food when it comes to our table. Light. No one in a one-room home can live without it. No one in a courtyard where homes are shared, where life is lived. No one can do this without the lights turned on. Go ahead, think Tom Bodet, that helps. I'm Tom Bodet from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. (laughs) Twin metaphors, salt and light. When Mark reaches for these metaphors, he says, you have salt within yourselves, so be at peace with one another. When Luke reaches for them, just after he's used them, Luke says this, you all, salt and light people, you'll, Luke, Luke says, the tax collectors and the sinners, they're all drawing near him now. And the Pharisees, the scribes, they murmured, saying, this man eats with sinners, he receives them. Consider that ancient biographers and good disciples who want to tell stories, they arrange their material in terms of relevance. We know this. So that now, when Jesus has just begun, in Matthew's Gospel, five large teaching segments, it's just begun, Jesus is sitting on the mount, and he can say anything next. This is what he says. Jesus has come, the Bible Bible says in chapter 4, he's come from healing large crowds of people of every disease, and they've followed along from Judea, from Jerusalem, from around the Decapolis. They're now with him on this mount, and the four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and this crowd, is this the potential group of disciples? That manifesto on the mount is still hanging in the air. What they've just learned is the divine directive that if you're part of this movement, in this movement, those who are in poverty, who are weak, who are hungry, they will be blessed. This is hanging in the air. If you are persecuted for my name's sake, and if you, if you buy into these commitments, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. All of you who will now be persecuted, you all are the salt and the light. Jesus can say anything. Matthew reaches for salt and light, that manifesto on the mountain. Stanley Harawas reminds us That the Beatitudes are less descriptions of people we ought to become, and they're more to warn us that we ought not be worried or cause concern when the poor and the hungry and the meek and the lonely follow Jesus. 
When the poor and the meek and the lonely and the hungry follow Jesus, the kingdom is alive. The kingdom's on the move. When the poor and the meek and the hungry and the lonely follow Jesus, what they will need, friends, is a table. It's interesting to me that Matthew can say anything and he reaches for salt and light, basic components of hospitality and companionship. To know where and with whom and how food is consumed, anthropologists tell us, we can infer just about everything else about this society. We are who we eat with. Jesus says, salt and light. Aristotle, 350 years before Jesus, Aristotle says, to be eating a bushel full of salt, that's to be with old friends. Diophanes, he lives the same time as Aristotle. Diophanes says, where's the salt? Where's the table? Plutarch, Plutarch lives in the generations just after Jesus. Plutarch says, the ones around the salt and the beans, those are my companions. In the context of the Manifesto now, the Sermon on the Mountain hanging in the air, any reading of this passage that privileges the disciples would make no sense. To say then that the gospel plus salt of the earth people equals better gospel violates the teaching. Salt of the earth people. The gospel, it's not that we enrich the gospel, it's that the gospel enriches us. Now we'll need to work on this, commending Christians for being salt of the earth people. That's a hierarchy and a privilege we've assigned the text. It's not there, and it's not our Jesus. We'll have to move to remove, re we'll have to work to remove this, and we'll have more work to do as Adventist Christians if we have read salt of the earth as our cue to preserve and protect our own distinct seasoning in the world. Any reading that elevates believers as custodians of Jesus is wrong. We'll have to work then as Adventist Christians on this passage. The point is not that Adventists feel special. The point is that we reveal a God who knows the world is special. So any reading of the passage that puts Jesus in our care will need to correct if the goodness of the gospel rocks us, our remnant identity, then maybe that's good news. Because the good news is good for all people. If it feels bad to us, then maybe we've done something wrong. And we ought to consider it again when it feels bad for some people. I'm asking the Spirit to teach us this morning. Here's what Christianity Today is running in the current issue, January, February issue, February issue, the headline. The season of Adventists, can Ben Carson's church stay separatist amid booming growth? Another one million members join the church. We are 18 million members strong now. And in the short article, they reflect, will we become generic Christians in the world or will we be able to preserve our distinctness? If our primary priority as Adventist Christians is to remain separatists, this could be foolish in light of our Jesus setting a banquet table for all people. <laughs> Friends, we just need a better headline. We need a better headline. Let's welcome a fresh, scripture-driven, Jesus-focused conversation about remnant identity. Let's do that. Why would we wait for the world to do that for us? Let's have that conversation. In scripture, the word remnants used more than 500 times from Genesis to Revelation. Those who are remnant, the remaining ones, they suffer and then survive chaos and war and famine and captivity. And they also, over and over again, fall into demise because they assume that they set the priority for their remnant. It will only be in the book of Revelation all the way at the end of the Bible when we can imagine a remnant who will be faithful to Jesus. Well, then let's have that conversation. We need a better headline. 
It's fascinating to me that when Matthew can say anything about Jesus, Jesus is reaching for salt and light. Do you know what it is about salt and light and the table? The table puts us in proximity to one another. The table, when we do this over and over again, shoulder to shoulder, living, it puts us in proximity. Meals become sacred proximity. Robin Myers warns in Christianity is presence, not proof. Christianity is presence, not proof. And my Adventist ears go to work on this idea. If meals put us in sacred proximity, and if Adventists are present truth people, present truth we've always said is truth that's on the move. There'll be more truth tomorrow. But our emphasis has been truth. What if we're present truth people? That what if we might need a little more presence and a little less truth? It's okay before you tweet that out. <laughs> before you tweet that out, if we are not present, it is not truth. If we are not present, it is not truth. Listen, I am Adventist as clear as I am female and Northern European. I will be Adventist, right? So hear me this morning, if, you, if someone asks you where you're born and you have to say sanitarium, you're an Adventist. <laughs> That's me. Maybe the meal around the table, friends, is as much for us as it is for everyone else because maybe we are also the poor and the weak and the lonely. Maybe we need to sit around tables together. Sacred proximity, this is where the kingdom gets activated. You want to be present truth, people? Let's be present. Let's be present in a world decidedly secular, reasoned to be secular. This is a conversation we have to have. If we're not present, it will never be truth for them. We're preparing now to hear Jesus' most difficult teachings the rest of today and tomorrow. It never gets more challenging, by the way. Don't be angry. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. Maybe it is that the only hope we have of making progress with these ethical imperatives we will be given is if we begin to pull up a chair and sit at a table, eat our meals with our enemies, eat our meals with those we cannot forgive, Eat all our meals with those who slap us on one cheek. I know it challenges every instinct we have. It challenges our instinct of what it is to be Adventist when we, I know why we reach for Daniel and Revelation as an Advent movement born in the Second Great Awakening, but if we're going to now put Jesus' core front and center and foundational, if the Sermon on the Mount, the manifesto from Jesus, becomes core to us, it changes everything. It challenges us. We know what we want our communities to look like. We all, we all come from these church communities. Whether it's stained glass and pipe organs, or whether it's a more tech-driven, tech modern, sleek, wood pallets, Ikea on steroids environment. <laughs> farm-to-table, organic, homemade, vegan potlucks we nurture. Come on. Church glam, I call it. We like nice. The world likes nice. I get it. But if we'll take the manifesto on the mountain seriously, it changes everything we do and imagine for the communities we're nurturing for our own little children and our own families and our own friends. This week at our church, just in one week, it looked like this. My friend and colleague, Steve, he comes across a group of young adult gang members in our parking lot. They've made it their home for the afternoon. Steve nicely escorts them away. Only a few hours later to hear an alarm go off, someone's broken into a building, they're gonna steal stuff, Steve's chasing someone through the neighborhood. Only a few hours later, here's a group of prepubescent little boys with their skateboards, 
Check it out. They're not just going through the parking lot. They've opened the church doors to the main office building. They've climbed the highest stairs. They're going to take a running leap, jam, land on their skateboards, and go down two or three landings full of stairs. And Steve's telling them, this is probably not the best way to use your time. These are our potential disciples. These are the people who will be at the table with your babies in our Sabbath school class. It's, they look like Mike. Mike was a guy who hung around our church for 10 or 12 years. He showed up on Sabbath morning, set up tables and chairs, and for doing that, he got 20 bucks a week. Mike came hungover and smelly every Sabbath. He knew us by name, and he stayed all morning long. He called me Chrissy, kissed me right here on the cheek every Sabbath. How are you, Chrissy? <laughs> it's all you can do not to grab for the hand sanitizer. Good sermon, Chrissy, even if one of the guys were preaching. <laughs> Mike fell asleep in Jesus in 2013 while at our church setting up tables and chairs for us. How bittersweet that he fell asleep with Jesus in our midst. People tried to bring him in off the streets. He didn't want to come. But once in a while, we found him on the floor of the church sleeping. How did that happen? Mike had a key to the church. <laughs> Not my brilliant move, but a pastor, Pastor Brad Wyden. So once in a while, we come in and we see Mike sleeping on the floor to stay warm and dry. Want a better headline? Thousands of Adventist church facilities open across North America to shelter the homeless. Want to get a headline? We have thousands of buildings that sit empty all week long. Let's go get a better headline. Jesus is what Jesus does. And I want to be able to tell the next generations of Adventist Christians, a whole group of them who led our worship yesterday morning, I want to look in their face and say to them, in order to follow Jesus and to obey Jesus, you do not have to leave the church. I want to say to my own two daughters sitting back here today, you do not have to leave the church to love Jesus. Jesus, this is what they said about him later, after the manifesto on the mountain. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Friends, let's set some tables. Grab the salt. Turn on the lights. Let's get on it. Amen. Amen. Chris's message is about salt and light. In what ways have we misunderstood this passage to privilege Christians and Christianity? The Beatitudes are less descriptions of people we ought to become, and they're more to warn us that we shouldn't be worried when the poor, the meek, and the lonely follow Jesus. When they follow Jesus, the kingdom is alive and on the move. How can we be more hospitable to those that need tables after they've begun to follow Jesus? How do we ensure that we don't create a hierarchy when hearing salt and light? And how do we ensure that the salt Jesus is talking about doesn't become our own Adventist seasoning in our community and world? Chris explores how table fellowship needs to be a part of every Jesus follower's life, noting that the truth of the gospel may be experienced before it is intellectually understood. How can you create space for more table fellowship in your own life for those who do not know Jesus yet? I was a five-year-old out on a Sabbath afternoon hike with my parents. The trail we were following was very narrow. As we were walking next to a steep drop, I let go of my father's hand, and in a blink of an eye, I was rolling down, heading straight to a huge boulder. My father saw my fall, 
and not considering his own well-being, he plunged down to get me. He rolled down the hill with me until his arm was able to wrap around me, stopping me inches away from the boulder. That's what love does. It sees the mess and runs towards it, even if it hurts. As I think about what my father did, I can't help but think of Jesus. He ran towards the mess. He was constantly running towards the messiest of all people. That's the type of church I dream about. A church that runs towards a mess. Jesus called us the salt of the earth. A people who would take a kingdom flavor to the world. Week after week, our pews are filled with people bursting with potential to change our world in the name of Jesus. However, one thing hinders the impact we could be making. We fear the world outside our salt shaker, so we never leave it. And in the meantime, millions of messy lives are falling with no one to take the plunge for them. You see, Christ was salt in the earth. His work was risky, but effective. He went into the dirtiest crevices of society and brought the kingdom flavor. I dream of a church rehabilitating more drug addicts and restoring the lives of porn addicts. I want to see liars and adulterers, pork eaters and modern day Pharisees worshiping together under one roof knowing that they're all on the same launching pad that will propel them into a new life in Christ. I want us to run towards a mess. I want to see my church washing society's feet. Because if we go to the mire and muck of culture, we will meet the ones Jesus loves. And when we're there, we will realize that with dirty hands, standing in the middle of the mess is Jesus himself. This is my dream. This is my journey. If you'd like more information on The One Project, or you would enjoy watching one of these presentations again, please visit them at www.theoneproject.org. That's www.thenumber1project.org. If you were moved by this presentation, we would invite you to experience a One Project gathering in person. The upcoming gatherings are listed on the website. Be blessed until we meet again. <laughs>